I've wanted to do that for a long time. Uh, good evening to you all. What a crowd. We didn't expect this many. It's wonderful to see you all. Uh, welcome to everybody joining us live in Ireland uh, via the internet and on RTE Lyric FM. We're absolutely thrilled that the Ambassador of Ireland is here uh, to give uh, the keynote speech uh, in our Irish festival and we've got a wonderful concert for you in about an hour or so. The rehearsals have been absolutely incredible today. So Anish, a Uishle, Kermish Falsha Riv, His Excellency Daniel Mulhall, Ambassador of Ireland. I'm delighted to be here this evening and I want to thank the Wigmore Hall for giving me the opportunity, first of all, to have a wonderful concert of Irish music which we will enjoy later on and secondly for giving me the opportunity to come here to talk about a hundred years of Irish culture. Now, we're here because this is the centenary of the Easter Rising. Now, centenaries are useful signposts in the landscape of our collective memory. They encourage us to take our bearings as individuals, as communities, and as nations. This past two years, Europeans have been remembering the catastrophic effects of World War I, the immense loss of life incurred, and the legacy of suspicion and bitterness that paved the way for an even greater and more costly conflict a generation later. 2016 is a big year of remembrance for Ireland. As we reflect on events in Dublin at Easter and on the Somme later in 1916 that had profound effects on Ireland north and south and on our ties with Britain. But a centenary would be a lost opportunity if it merely shone the light of knowledge on a single event or a series of events. The passage of a hundred years encourages us, and should encourage us, to reflect on a significant slice of past time and to draw balance sheets of achievements, missed opportunities, and failings. And this year has seen a vigorous debate in Ireland along those lines. Our contemporary condition in 2016 has been repeatedly analyzed with reference to the ideals enshrined in the 1916 proclamation. And a range of judgments have been passed by commentators in Ireland and beyond. Ireland in 2016 is, of course, incomparably more prosperous, more inclusive, and more at ease with itself than it was 100 years ago when there were various divisions in Irish society between unionists and nationalists and so forth. That is not, of course, to claim that Ireland's record over the past century has been without blemish. There are certainly no grounds for complacency. For all European countries, the challenges of today, stemming from contemporary developments in the wider world, are very different, but no less daunting than those that faced our predecessors in the early 20th century. Now, while there was much debate about the social, political, and economic fruits of Irish independence, there is, I think, a general consensus that independent Ireland can lay a very valid claim to significant cultural achievement. And that is what I am here to talk about this evening. Much of what I have to say will focus on literature, because that's what I know best, and it's also the easiest thing to illustrate with quotations. Much more difficult for me to illustrate the, um, uh, the works of Irish composers or still less the um, works of Irish visual artists. But most of what I have to say has also got a general application to music and to the visual arts. Now, 1916 is actually a good place to start a discussion of a century of Irish culture. For part of the backdrop to the Easter Rising was a new style of nationalism that developed in Ireland in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, which placed a new emphasis on identity. Now, 19th century Ireland had undergone a process of steady Anglicization, 
and there was a, a gradual and relentless decline of the Irish language and an unstoppable spread of English as the language of everyday life in Ireland. But things started to change in the closing decades of the 19th century. In 1884, a man called Michael Cusack, who will be known to most people here as a character in James Joyce's Ulysses, where he was the citizen, this nationalist figure that Joyce uh, parodied so brilliantly, if unfairly, in that great novel. But in 1884, Cusack wrote about, and I quote, the tyranny of imported and enforced customs and manners. He argued that the neglect of national pastimes is, quote, a sure sign of national decay and of approaching dissolution. His remedy was the creation in November 1884 of the Gaelic Athletic Association with the objective of promoting native Irish games. Now the Gaelic Athletic Association or the GAA remains the most important sporting body in Ireland to this very day. And that just shows you the power of the legacy of that period, the 25 years or so leading up to the Easter Rising of 1916. The continued success of the GAA is one of the legacies of the period before the attainment of Irish independence in 1922. Some years later, in 1892, Douglas Hyde, the son of a Church of Ireland clergyman, delivered probably the most influential speech in the intellectual history of modern Ireland. It was called the necessity of de-anglicizing Ireland. And he pointed to what he saw as, and I quote, the folly of neglecting what is Irish and hastening to adopt pell-mell and indiscriminately everything that is English simply because it is English. Hyde's call for a revival of Irish, of the Irish language and Irish customs led in 1893 to the founding of the Gaelic League, or Conan Gaelga, which sought to bring about a revival of the Irish language and whose membership spread rapidly in the following two decades. There were also developments in literature driven mainly by W.B. Yeats, namely the establishment of the Irish National Literary Society in 1892 and the founding of the Abbey Theatre, still Ireland's national theatre, in 1904. Yeats, in fact, wondered later in his life if his nationalist play, Kathleen Ni Houlihan, had sent out, quote, certain men the English shot. Yeats believed that his play may have influenced some of those who fought in the Easter Rising of 1916. Now, it is sometimes said that the Easter Rising was a poet's rebellion, but that would be a simplification of an event to which many factors contributed. It is, however, noteworthy that four of the seven signatories of the proclamation of the Irish Republic on Easter Monday, 1916, entered nationalist politics through their membership of the Gaelic League. In other words, they were first and foremost language revivalists. Three of the four, Patrick Pierce, Thomas McDonough, and Joseph Plunkett, were published poets, quite talented writers. And many of those who took part in the events of 1916 were active members of the Gaelic Athletic Association. So you can see how all of these nationalist organizations provided some of the backdrop to the Easter Rising of 1916. So culture played a major part in bringing about the conditions required to create the Easter Rising of 1916. Now, the events of 1916 also proved themselves to be very inspirational for a number of Irish writers, most notably W.B. Yeats and the playwright Sean O'Casey, who lived much of his life here in Britain. Now, the more I read it, the more convinced I am that Yeats's Easter 1916 is one of the finest public poems of the 20th century, certainly in the English language. Yeats realized, writing in the immediate aftermath of Easter 1916, that the rising had, that Ireland had been changed utterly, as he said, by the events of 1916. Now, Yeats was no great admirer of the leaders of the rebellion. 
In fact, privately, he was quite critical of them. But he was moved by what he saw as the valour of their actions, even if he wondered, quote, was it needless death after all? Now, Yeats engaged in an early exercise in what we now call historical revisionism, when he wrote that, and I quote, England may keep faith for all that is done and said. Now, this refers to the fact that Irish home rule, which we would now call devolution, had been finally granted after decades of struggle in 1914, but unfortunately had to be or was deferred until after the end of the war. And of course, it never came into being because the First World War and the Easter Rising changed everything in Ireland. Now, to this day, there are those in Ireland who argue that it would have been better had the Rising never taken place and Ireland achieved home rule in a peaceful manner. In truth, we can never know what might have happened in 1918 had there been no Easter Rising. This year's commemoration has focused on what happened in all of its diversity and complexity as opposed to what might have happened. That's a matter for speculation, but when you commemorate, you commemorate what happened. Now, Yeats's ambivalence towards the Rising is perfectly crystallized in his description of Easter 1916 as a terrible beauty. And this year's commemorations have paid attention to both of Yeats's words, terrible and beauty. Our commemorations have focused on the progressive idealism of the proclamation, which committed itself to respect the rights of all and also committed uh, the Republic to having votes for all men and women. In other words, quite advanced by the standards of its time. However, we've also recognized the fact that more than half of the casualties of Easter week were civilians, Irish civilians. So it was both terrible and it had its beautiful and noble aspects as well. Now, Sean O'Casey's Plow on the Stars, which caused disturbances when it was first produced in the Abbey Theatre in 1926, takes a more irreverent look at the rising, as seen through the eyes of Dublin's struggling tenement dwellers, especially Nora Clitheroe, who pleads unsuccessfully with her husband not to join the fighting in which he's eventually killed. Now, as in many of O'Casey's plays, some of the most memorable lines are given to comic figures. In this case, a figure called Fluther Good. And Fluther uh, is, and those who know, um, our, our um, sort of our version, um, our, our Hiberno-English will know that fluter generally means someone who likes a drink. Um, so, um, so um, in sort of, uh, I mean, our own um, uh, sort of idiomatic slang. Um, but anyway, fluter, he's in the pub, and he hears Patrick Pierce giving one of his famous speeches outside on the street, and he's he responds in a mock heroic fashion, no doubt his heroism is, is um, induced partly by, by being in the pub. And he says, he says, I can die now, he says, and I quote, for you've seen the shadow dreams of the past leap into life in the bodies of living men that show if we were without a titter of courage for centuries, we're vice versa now. <laughs> That's fruiter for you. Another character, Rosie Redmond, refuses to countenance fighting for, quote, freedom that wouldn't be worth winning in a raffle, she said. <laughs> By the time he wrote this, O'Casey had come to believe that the members of the Irish Citizen Army who had fought in the Rising had been duped into fighting for a bourgeois cause inimical to their own working class interests. O'Casey's dissident views set a trend for 20th century Irish literature as Irish writers became a critical voice challenging mainstream views and values. Disenchantment and exile became a common fate for some of our writers, Joyce and Beckett being the prime examples. Even if in Joyce's case, after he left Ireland in 1904, he hardly ever wrote a word that wasn't set in the Ireland of the early 20th century which Joyce had left. When he left Ireland, Joyce was determined to, and I quote, fly the nets of religion nationality and language which he felt were holding him back and stopping him from being a proper artist. And he wanted Ireland to become more European. Now this was an unlikely 
option for a country like Ireland, where the leading figures in the newly independent Ireland had been schooled in what was called the Irish-Ireland ethos of the early 20th century. They wanted Ireland to be more thoroughly Irish, and they viewed a distinctive Irish identity as the main rationale for political independence. In other words, you became independent because you were a separate identity, you were a separate culture, a separate people, a separate nation. So the culture was so intrinsic to the independence struggle that after the advent of independence, there was a certain narrowing of the focus of Irish nationalism. And there was something of a culture war in the early decades of the 20th century between those who wanted to cultivate a more exclusively Irish identity and those who viewed Irish identity in broader terms. Indeed, there were some who argued that no literature written in English could possibly be Irish, that you could only write an Irish literature in the Irish language. Now, to what can we attribute the extraordinary success of 20th century Irish writing? From Yeats to Seamus Heaney, from James Joyce to John McGahern and William Trevor, with four Nobel Prize winners during that hundred years of the 20th century. It seems to me this has something to do with the evolution of Ireland's national story, a story of an expansive romantic nationalism successfully challenging a great empire, and then with its aspirations accomplished, turning inwards and adopting a narrower form of nationalism which our writers often raged against. But their rage against what they didn't like in Ireland was actually an inspiration for much of their work. So this failure to achieve what writers might have thought as the appropriate outcome for an independent Ireland actually was one of the, the things that drove many of our writers to write the works that they produced. Now the 1920s, 30s and 40s were difficult times for Ireland as the country struggled to make a reality of independence in very difficult circumstances in the aftermath of the First World War and then the Great Depression. And many writers, I'll give you an example of um, the Northern Irish writer Louis McNeese who wrote about Dublin in 1941. He said, quote, but she holds my mind with her seedy elegance, with her gentle veils of rain, and all that hide behind her Georgian facades, the catcalls and the pain, the glamour of her squalor, the bravado of her talk. Or listen to the disenchantment of the poet Austin Clarke, a trenchant critic of the values of Catholic Ireland in the first decades of, of Irish independence, who wrote, think children of institutions mured above your ignorance, where every look is veiled, state paid to snatch away the folly of poor lovers, for whom it seems the sacraments have failed. Now a new poetic voice emerged in the late 1930s and 40s, Patrick Kavanagh, who combined a fiercely critical portrait of the meagerness of life in rural Ireland in his long poem, The Great Hunger, with an equally fierce pride in his locality. In The Great Hunger, he wrote, quote, of life as it is broken back over the book of death. Is there some light of imagination in these wet clods, he wondered. But in a poem called Epic, he struck a different note. And he said, he wrote, quote, I inclined to lose faith in Ballyrush and Gorton till Homer's ghost came whispering to my mind. He said, I made the Iliad from such a local row. Gods make their own importance. Therein lies part of the story of Ireland's 20th century odyssey an unprepossessing economic and social environment against whose strictures our writers laid down verbal gauntlets, coupled with a pride in the local and the familiar. Now, Irish literature in the 1960s and 70s developed in tandem with the evolution of Irish society. And this led my old teacher at UCC in Cork, John Montague, in conscious echo of Yeats's September 1913 to proclaim Puritan Ireland's dead and gone, a myth of O'Connor and O'Fuelon. This refers to the short stories of Frank O'Connor and Sean O'Fuelon, which delved into the life of provincial and rural Ireland in the decades after independence. O'Fuelon battled against what he saw as an excessively narrow 
versions of Irish identity, especially in his magazine called The Bell, which he edited from 1940 to 1946, a brilliant piece of work, and in which he complained about the absence from Ireland of a native urban society with intellectual energy. He opposed what he called Celtophiles, Little Irelanders, Pietists and Anglophobes. In his view, quote, a parochial Ireland bounded by its own shores has no part in our ideal nation that will come out of this dull period. Now this dull period did eventually come to an end with the revival of the Irish economy in the late 1950s, with membership of the European Union from 1973 onwards, and sadly with the outbreak of conflict in Northern Ireland in the late 1960s. All of this meant that critiques of a conservative introspective society could no longer be the mainstay of Irish writing. Moreover, many of our leading poets in the final decades of the 20th century came from Northern Ireland and their work was shaped by the experience of that contested space in Northern Ireland. Seamus Heaney described himself as growing up, quote, cabined and confined, besieged within a siege, whispering Morse, and as he described Northern Ireland as, quote, a land of password, hand grip, wink and nod, of open minds as open as a trap. Then his friend, Michael Longley, made the case for reconciliation with reference to Homer's Iliad. I get down on my knees and do what must be done and kiss Achilles' hand, the killer of my son. And away from the turbulence of Northern Ireland, the poet Evan Boland, a daughter of one of my predecessors as ambassador in London, Freddie Boland, living in a Dublin suburb in the 1960s. She described the suburb in Dublin as, quote, unmapped and unvisited in any literary sense. And she came to see her poems as a forceful engagement between a life and a language. She wrote of, quote, the claustrophobia of your back gardens, varicose with shrubs, make an ugly sister of you, suburbia. The debate about the authenticity of Anglo-Irish literature is now a thing of the past. Irish literature is now written in two languages, each with its own perspective and authentic voice. The publication of two recent English language translations of the 20th century Irish language classic, Crane Achille, or The Graveyard Clay, has brought home the unique qualities of writing in Irish. And I recommend this book, Graveyard Clay, if you like Flann O'Brien, you'll really enjoy Martin O'Kine. He starts off as follows, because it's all about a corpse lying in the graveyard and wondering what's happening above ground. I wonder, am I buried in the pound plot or the 15 shilling plot? Or did the devil possess them to dump me in the half guinea plot after all my warnings? <laughs> There's more than a touch of, of uh, Flann O'Brien there, I, I think. The vision and vigour of contemporary writing in Irish is a match, I think, for anything, anywhere. Witness Biddy Jenkinson, a modernist Irish language poet. She's actually the wife of one of my former colleagues in the Department of Foreign Affairs, our ambassador to Finland and elsewhere. Um, and in one of her poems in 1991, writing about the, the war in Iraq, in the Irish language, this is a translation, don't tell me that life is in hiding that seeds will sprout, that your spring kisses will make flocks of birds. Let us stand without kissing, without hope, in the place of the dead, under every bomb that drops, to testify that this is not done in our name. You won't get much more powerful writing than that in any language. Now, while there is no time to delve into the works of contemporary writers, we have many, and I think um, the question is, will any of the young writers, Claire Keegan, Sarah Baum, Mary Costello, Katrina Lally, Lisa McInerney, Louise O'Neill, Rob Doyle, Kevin Barry, Colin Barrett. Will any of these writers be able to scale the global heights of the 20th century Irish masters, Yeats, Shaw, Joyce, O'Casey, Beckett and Heaney? No pressure, guys, is what I say. <laughs> Another feature of our experience that stems from late 19th century cultural revival is the survival and indeed the flowering of traditional Irish music over the past hundred years. Now, it is not a coincidence that the revival of Irish music started really in the late 1890s where traditional piping underwent a revival. There was what was called the Fesh Keol, first held in 1897 and so on. Now with the, in, with the emergence of an independent Ireland and the prevailing philosophy of the new state which was to emphasize all things Irish, 
there was, it seems, there was naturally, it seems to me, a push to promote native art forms. People of conservative mind tended to worry about the impact of dance halls and jazz music on traditional values. Renewed interest in Irish folk traditions arose out of international developments in the 1950s and 1960s. And the Flack Yole movement, the, the annual gathering of traditional musicians, began in 1950. So the economy was starting to open out, and you had this boom in traditional music, influenced, of course, by developments elsewhere in the world, particularly in America, with the folk revival there. The Irish music organization called the Skjold Torrieran was established in 1950 and has been a considerable success, including here in Britain, although it wasn't without its criticisms. One critic said that they were uh, criticised it for encouraging ballad groups and promoting the tourism industry. Oh dear. Um, in the chapter on 20th century music in the New History of Ireland, Volume 7, it is said that the popularisation of traditional music since the mid-century has been achieved by adulterations that leave many people without a clear view of what traditional musical style and repertoire really are. Now, my own inexpert view is that a recognisably Irish form of traditional music has managed to successfully navigate the currents of the modern world. While Irish traditional music as it is today may not meet an antiquarian test of authenticity, it is nonetheless a living culture and has shown a capacity to adapt and to blend with other, other cultures to the advantage of Ireland's rich musical traditions. Personally, I became interested in Irish traditional music in the late 1960s as a consequence of the emergence of groups like Planxty and the Bothy Band who combined traditional Irish idioms with contemporary international folk music developments. These had an appeal for my generation and background that would not have been possible for more purist forms of traditional music to achieve. Um, classical music ha had a similar um, development in Ireland. Our leading uh, Irish composer of the 20th century, Alois Fleischmann, born in, uh, in, in Dachau in Bavaria in 1910. I went there to celebrate his centenary in 2010 when I was ambassador in Germany. Fleischmann, his father was a, a German-born church organist in Cork. He married a woman whose father was also a church organist in Cork, so two German musicians. So his family absolutely steeped in German traditions and classical music. And yet, Fleischmann, Alice Fleischmann, growing up in Cork, became an enthusiast for all things Gaelic, for all things Irish, was a fluent speaker of the Irish language, and as his, his entry in the Dictionary of Irish Biography says, quote, he sought to write in a modern style that was intrinsically Irish and frequently used Irish motifs and thematic elements. Now, um, I'll have to skip a bit because I know I'm coming to the end of my, my um, allotted time, but uh, I will put my text, which also covers um, painting and so forth, on the website uh, tomorrow, and I will tweet a link to it on my Twitter account. But just to finish, um, one of the things that characterizes Ireland, it seems to me, is whether in literature, music, or painting, is a blending of different strands, traditional and contemporary, into a workable mix. The poet and journalist George Russell, AE, who was a friend of W.B. Yeats, warned in the 1920s that Ireland, driven by a nationalist idealism, must avoid shutting itself off from the world in a Gaelic bastion. He favoured, quote, the wedding of Gaelic to world culture. Otherwise, he said, Ireland would, would not be a nation, but a parish. It seems to me that Russell's aspirations have largely been fulfilled. Today's Ireland is a globally connected society but it retains its distinctive cultural profile. But I can understand why there are, were so many people in the early decades of independence who viewed the outside world with weariness and wanted to cultivate Ireland's cultural distinctiveness. Devoid of that push to cultivate Ireland's native traditions aggressively and maybe in a narrowly focused way, I wonder, without that push, if we would today possess the kind of traditional contemporary mix that today's Ireland manifests. During the past hundred years, we have striven to make our independence work for us in a changing, challenging economic environment. Part of what, we, what needed to be done was to reconcile our pride in what was distinctively Irish 
with the experience of our people, a global people who have settled all over the world, who have been exposed more than most to the currents of contemporary culture, dominated as it has been for much of the past century by the Anglo-American world to which Ireland belongs, although there is more to us than that. There are, of course, no guarantees for the future. It may be that continued globalization will engender a homogenized, saccharine, popular culture in years and decades ahead, and that Ireland's distinctiveness will be gradually eroded. On the other hand, the networks that transmit information and ideas globally through the internet can, it seems to me, also provide opportunities for a diversity of expression. Almost a century ago, in his great poem, The Second Coming, W.B. Yeats wrote that things fall apart, the centre cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. But the fact is, things have tended somehow to stay together over the past hundred years. It's still all to play for, of course, politically, economically and culturally. And let's enjoy some first class playing and singing this evening with Irish and broader international and European elements delightfully intertwined. Thank you very much, Gunnar Milamagu. It's a, a great pleasure for us and a great privilege at uh, the start of this very commemorative event to meet someone in Lyric who we've never, believe it or not, had the opportunity to do so. And I couldn't be more delighted than to welcome one of our country's most celebrated musical exports. There's no question about it. Anne-Marie, you are so very welcome. Oh, thank you very much. It's <laughs> lovely to be here. You know, and tonight is a commemorative event, but as I said, mm. it gave us an opportunity in meeting you for the first time to commemorate some of your own affectionate memories of a quite extraordinary career, and that's really underestimating it in many ways. But it did, of course, like everything, have a beginning and whether or not singing is something you come to there's no doubt that with you it was in place pretty early it seems as if you were singing almost before you could talk i think you're right um again you know it's always mothers i think pretty well and my mother heard that i had some sort of good sound i had a good ear as a child i used to sing a lot at, uh, and then of course the tradition of feshkyol uh, was tremendously important in our day when we were starting off, as it is now. I've noticed how hugely important it still is. I was going to say we're only too well aware of what an extraordinary institution Absolutely that is in this country. Absolutely amazing. And almost peculiar. Maybe perhaps the the Welsh Stratford tradition might be similar. I think that's absolutely right. I think you're right. Uh, but that's that's how I came by performing at all. My mother was a very fine pianist and her brother who lived with us, Uncle Tom, he they could play anything. You know, what key would you like it in? It was always that. Um, and she played at the Feshkjol for me and for anybody else who was coming in. You know, she could play anything and she was very gracious and generous about sharing her her talent you know she was up there it wasn't that she was pushing me in the sense she she thought that I would have a chance but um she she was so excited when she would hear a good voice uh, I remember she rang me some years ago and she said I've heard this wonderful voice she said I he's going to go really far and his name was Robin Trichler with uh -huh. whom I have the pleasure of singing uh, yeah. Schubert duet this evening and no stranger to us of course on oh the, it's uh, fabulous you know, yeah it's in delightful. those early days can you remember can you remember any of the songs that you sang. Oh, yes, I can. My The very first song uh, was an action song called My Wish. And I was dressed in a black sort of crimpling thing, like an old granny's thing with, with white flowers on. And I had a doily on my head and a, and a velvet ribbon around it. I've just got a picture of it at home. And the song went, oh, I wish, oh, I wish that I had a little house with a cat and a mat and a whole leaf for the mouse and a clock going tock in the corner of the room. And then I picked it up, a kettle and a saucepan and a big birch broom. <laughs> and I got 90 percent. I say, of course, education intervenes and yes. uh, you went to school in Monaghan. I did. And uh, eventually you go to UCD. What did you read at UCD? Um, a chaotic year. I got my place, I have to say, in my defence. Chaotic year of Irish, English, French and music. 
and Professor Hughes was our head of music. And I don't know how he did it. We were in that big place up by University Church, uh, whatever that room, that house was called, uh, where the music department was. And we had huge manuscript books. And he would go, Miss Murray, and he'd lift the manuscript book and he would frisbee it from the top of the room to the back of quite a long room. And I don't know how he did it. Every time he did it, the um, manuscript would open on the way and it would land on my desk with the page open, covered in red marks. I mean, just bleeding <laughs> with, with mistakes. I remember that so very well. He was a really tough gentleman and I found all of that private studying uh, rather difficult having been in institutions since I was four pretty well you know and gone away to to Monaghan as you say from the age of 10. But of course throughout all this time uh, you are singing but I imagine it is around now that some serious decisions had to be made. Gosh you're that's very clever of you um the year that uh, I was 17 18 whatever it was um I did the Feshkjol again and uh I think I did I took part in seven or eight competitions, the the bigger ones that, you know, the John McCormick Cup, the Irish Cup. And by some fluke, I won them all. And there were two people. I can't remember the head of Radio 2 of the BBC was also one of the adjudicators. The other one was a man called Herrick Bunny, who was the uh, organist at St Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh and a wonderful singing teacher and, and soprano called Ina Mitchell. And they both spoke to my mother and father and said they thought that I had a possibility of a chance of a career. But they felt that if I stayed in university until I was 21 or whatever it was, that it might be a little late to get started. And they felt that I should go and see what I could do uh, at that time. Um, I was being taught by a wonderful woman who nearly drove me insane, but she was wonderful, called Nancy Calthorpe. She taught me uh, harp and uh, harmony and theory and all sorts of and and singing and I went to Dorothy Stokes for piano at the academy but the others were down in the previous and Veronica Dunn at one stage in your one lesson uh, with Veronica Dunn when I was 11 she taught me Voike Sapete oh how fortuitous is that would isn't that amazing yes yeah at 11 just just or maybe it was 10 just before I went away to school You've mentioned uh, competitions and the fesh in particular. And I do want to come back to that later on. But, but as we're now on the, the path mm. of your career, mm. you make your way to uh, England. And you might imagine straight to the Royal College of Music or whatever. Well, that was no, definitely it, not the way for no, you. You were I, very keen to uh, apply for... Uh, well, it would have been Manchester, I suppose, to become the Royal Northern College. Since. That's correct, yes. And it's you called the Royal it. Manchester College of Music. And I only went there, I was on my way, strange enough, to uh, have a, an audition at the Guildhall School of Music with a man called Fabian Smith. And Dorina Gibson, the wonderful Irish pianist, was studying with Gordon Green in Manchester, had contact with Miss Calthorpe, as all these things used to happen. And she said, the principal of this college has a wonderful reputation as a singing teacher. It might be worth her while visiting on the way. So down we go on the mail boat over to Hollyhead, over to Manchester, and we sit in Piccadilly Square for, from seven o'clock in the morning until half past two when my audition was. Uh, because we hadn't any money to go and stay in a hotel and we were we were going either to London or back on the boat and um, went up and uh, Frederick Cox, Mr Cox, was very much, he was like Wilfred Hyde White a little bit and he came in this slightly bent, stooped gentleman, quite elderly and he'd been rather poorly and he gave me a singing lesson and by some miracle offered me a, a scholarship and a small bursary on the spot. So we went home and I came back. And my mother, of course, without five minutes delay, had found me a convent to stay in. <laughs> <laughs> the Sisters of Mercy. But I you did. You loved it. <clears throat> I loved no. Manchester. I could. I would have. I would have floundered completely in in London. In fact, I've always found London a, a challenge. And you've said since, <laughs> uh, particularly about <clears throat> Manchester, that you were part. Uh, of a golden era, really, from the college. <gasps> Absolutely. Wonderful singers. My goodness me, from... Oh, gosh, I'm, I can't even think of all of them. John Tomlinson, um, Gwyn Howell. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to miss out people, excuse me. Rosalind Plowright. There were so many. There was such a wealth of, of singing and music of all sorts. I think most of the orchestras of England, uh, uh, maybe elsewhere, but certainly most of the main orchestras of England were led by somebody who had been trained in Manchester because the, the standard of teaching was extraordinary. And it was obviously, I get the sense, not just 
a very formative time, but a very nourishingly happy time, one of the yes. happiest times in yes, your career. Yes, absolutely And that's right. important at that yes. stage because yes. not everybody enjoys training. It can be very yes. traumatic for but some people. But I think it's something to do again with the way I had been educated. Um, I was a very biddable and very um, disciplined and uh, obedient more than anything else, I suppose, out of fear and not out of any sense of duty. But um, I was very obedient. So I had four, for two years, I had four singing lessons a week just on technique. I didn't sing another note and all my contemporaries were singing bits of Verdi, bits of Rossini, bits of nothing. And finally, I was given one of these very uh, easy easy then nothing's easy but simple uh, arie antique one of these old songs and uh, that was the first thing I was given I thought I mean given the whole of you know the Wagner roles for mezzo soprano I tell you but I was a soprano at that time and with a very light voice yeah uh, it, it's uh, awful to sort of jump ahead in in in, in swathes but nevertheless I think it's fair to say that as far as we're concerned and, and your audience are concerned the big step forward for you the most significant thing to happen next was the role of Carabino at the Opera House in 1976 I think it was unfortunately when... yes <laughs> I'm not sure why you say unfortunately. Well, because it's all gone so very quickly. You know, <laughs> quickly and I now sing Marcellina in the opera that I call The Marriage of the Son of Marcellina. <laughs> it's not the marriage of Figaro in my eyes, I can tell you. <laughs> but uh, this is, a, it's, you know, the opportunity. Uh, it, it's the dream come true for any young singer. Yeah, but a I wasn't ready. Oppor- I was going to say a wonderful opportunity, but it must have been incredibly daunting. Singing was never a problem. Pretty well. I mean, I've had, obviously, like everybody else, we've had our our worries. But singing was never the problem. It was very much the problem of, A, coming from Dublin via Manchester, which was just almost Dublin, if you know what I mean, and not having uh, that that social polish that... uh, the the artists from from London seemed to have. I just I never had that, and I didn't have any connections either. I didn't know anybody because I'd come from Manchester. I knew everybody in Manchester, but I didn't know anybody in London, and I had all that that feeling of you know the way we were brought up. You know, don't boast, don't be arrogant. And then I'd be standing there thinking, well, I better not do that because that'll be arrogant. And then I wouldn't do it, and they'd think I was stupid. <laughs> so by the time I was finished, I really needed to to get away to somewhere. That, who, that didn't know me uh, and that I could find my own feet and th- that happened very, very fortuitously, I must say. And that's the extraordinary thing about your career. It has truly been an international career and you mentioned Germany now, which moves you on to this next stage. That's correct. Um, <clears throat> were there any particular people, events or mm-hmm. roles there that you suddenly realised, ah, I, I've, I've passed through another? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, again, all of these things happen by, uh, certainly in my case, I've been so lucky that each one has unfolded another opportunity. Um, I you had, went to Cologne, is that right? That's correct. With- I had won a um, a competition which allowed me a half, half a, a recital, a lunchtime recital uh, on the BBC. And uh, my colleague, uh, Lucia Pop, heard me on the radio liked my voice and asked her agent, who happened to be sort of my agent at the time, um, uh, if she knew me. And she said, yes, we do. Well, we're looking for a Cenerentola in Cologne, uh, in German. Do you think we think she'd be able to do it? So she was she was then married to George Fisher, who was the head of uh, conductor at uh, Cologne with uh, Sir John Pritchard. And I went to audition and they gave me the job and uh, they gave me a contract of... I wasn't fest there, I, I didn't stay there, but they gave me a contract of, let's say, 15 or 20 nights a year. And then subsequently other houses gave me the same. So I spent a lot of time in Germany. But at my audition, that was the key. Um, I sang the Cenerentola aria and the head of the opera house, um, Michael Hamper, said, could somebody get Jean-Pierre Ponel for us? And uh, he, he had, I was standing on the stage of the Don Giovanni production that he was doing and he'd just gone off for lunch mm-hmm. and I was doing... So they got him back and he heard me. And from that, from that moment, that was the, the, the making of my confidence. Working with Ponel. Yeah. 
he was absolutely amazing. So it seems that that, that first experience that you had, and of course, subsequently you went on to have a glorious career in Germany, but that first experience provided you with the opportunity to really um, develop personally, actually, yes, and sort of sort yourself out. Absolutely right. And, and he he was very much of the uh, idea that it didn't really, really matter where you came from. The essence of the music, and it was most of the first amount of work I did was with uh, uh, Jean-Pierre Panel and Maestro Harnoncourt. They were doing more of the Mozart cycle in, in Zurich, and that's that's how it all happened. And I used to be at rehearsals a half an hour, you know, an hour early in the hope that we'd start early. Like in the old days, I used to stand at the airport thinking that the plane would go early if I got there early. Of course, it never does. But he he just inspired us so much and he was wonderful. I remember one production we did of Mitridate and we, we worked quite intensively for the first 10 days and it was really good what we did. It was a brand new production and he said, do you know, I think you are doing so well, everybody. Thank you very much. Take a long weekend and I'll see you next Tuesday. You know, people don't do that nowadays. You sit for hours upon hour upon hour upon hour. And it's it's that sort of idea. The more time you've got, the more you will fill. And he said, go away and think about it. And uh, so he gave us five days off or whatever. And we came back and the the freshness and the excitement and the the joy at finding something new and thinking about it. We'd only just met all of us. Yeah. You know, I didn't know who half the people were. And it was just all of these ex- uh, experiences were delightful, I must say. Absolutely amazing. One of the things that I think is interesting about you and that I pick up from what you said, you use the word we a lot. And I get the sense that the whole cohesive feel of a company mm. is something that's very attractive to you. The thought mm. in any way or notion of being an operatic diva would be an anathema couldn't that would turn it. you cold. Yes, I couldn't bear it. I've never been able to do it. And how do you, you know, I wonder how someone who is so determined as you have been to maintain that kind of value, despite the wonderful things that have happened to you and the way you could become isolated, you've always managed somehow to remain part of a company. Do you ever rub up against times when you you do have to deal with the extraordinary difficulty? Yes, I've had, I've had not very many. I've had maybe half a dozen uh, colleagues uh, I've been concerned about. I just yeah. thought, well, if I don't see you again, it'll be too soon. <laughs> but I'm sure they maybe say the same about me. But but generally speaking, I have, I've had wonderful opportunities. Mm. Wonderful, wonderful opportunities. I remember Kathleen Ferrier saying in her biography about uh-huh. Herbert von Karajan, and she writes in capital letters, I can shout too. <laughs> I can shout just as loudly if I have to. But he didn't want people to... I, I auditioned to him. And uh, he he sent for me when I was my first year in Salzburg. I was going to say, of course, that you've had a long association with the festival in Salzburg, yes, so yes. you must have through uh, Cornell. Uh, and how did you find von Karajan? I just laughed. I'm so sorry. He's I mean, he was a genius, absolutely amazing. But um, he asked me to uh, audition, and I auditioned with uh, Cherubino and C minor mass or something and his secretary who was a wonderful lady called Frau Burchardt said you know sing quietly sing quietly I sang so quietly the poor pianist couldn't hear me and I can really sing quietly when I want to and he said to me my voice was too big for the for the festival house and I just laughed I mean I'm not saying anything behind him because I laughed in front of him I said oh I said I'm terribly sorry uh, anyway uh, I subsequently just did four amens in in um, in the creation. He didn't have a mezzo. This was you know a hundred years ago, nineteen eighty one or ninety two or whatever it was. But he was he was amazing to sit. You know, I I had to sit for the whole performance uh, in front of the cello section, uh, and just to look at him conducting. He was amazing. You know, the way he conducted. He conducted like a seven foot magnificent Adonis. You know, and he was quite a short gentleman. He was and he was also quite ill by the time I. It was towards the end of his career yeah. and the end of his life then. But, but that, that was the only time our paths crossed. That festival, which is very close to your heart, is, of course, will always be so closely associated with him. And indeed, yes, his, house, of course. His, his home sort of overlooks the river at that uh, point towards the theatre. Absolutely, so absolutely, uh, yeah. It's a very special place, yes. Salzburg. But planes, but planes fly over nowadays. They didn't in his day. <laughs> he wouldn't have allowed they it. They didn't allow it, no. They had, to, they had to change the path or close the airport. I want to take you um, back again to London because uh, we live a very uh, 
interesting times in terms of the arts. When you returned to London, of course, it must have seemed that those years in Germany had been uh, quite a sabbatical, really. You must have been a different person in many ways. You return and the opportunities at Covent Garden await. But of course, now also the opportunities at the alternative house, the ENO. Mm -hmm. Now, the ENO, as we know, is going through... So terrible administrative difficulties so at the minute, which yes. is, of course, sad but, and of great concern. Yes, it but is. But I would assume that you would be such a strong advocate for the ENO, and I was wondering if you were able to sort of tell us very briefly what the, those differences, if there are differences indeed, fundamental differences might be between Covent Garden and the ENO. What Gosh, makes it me. different? Now, that's, that's a very difficult question because the repertoire I did pretty well, all of the repertoire I sang at, Covent, at um, the English National Opera, mm -hmm. I never sang... Uh, at, at, Co at Covent Garden. Garden. Um, I was brought in to the ENO by uh, Peter Jonas, who was looking for somebody to sing Xerxes of Handel um, in a production of uh, Sir Nicholas Heitner, who went on to the most amazing Nicholas things. Heidner, yeah, Midas Heitner, unbelievable, with talent and, and what he has done for the National Theatre and for theatre in England Absolutely. overall, for film, for He himself opera. came from the Royal Exchange in Manchester. That is I correct, think. and Cheatham School, that's absolutely mm -hmm. right. Amazing, and I think it was his first opera, and I think he did the translation. So this, this huge new era of Handel being sort of kicked into the 20th century with a modern production, so clever, so intelligent, that's still running, what, 1986? Four it was so it's still running since 1984 they still perform it because it mm. is absolutely brilliant then Ariodante with David Alden then um, Martin Duncan then we all went to, to Munich when uh, Peter Jonas thank goodness I'd already been there I'd started there in 81 and then that started a a series of cult performances because they'd never had Handel before. And you mentioned another of the characteristics that is peculiar, I think, particularly to the, you know, the English translations. I loved, I love it. I loved these translations. They were so, so clever. Uh, Amanda Holden did many of the translations in which I took part. And, and they were just so beautiful. And I think th that that type of repertoire suited that house. It was mm -hmm. just the right thing. And the two balanced together, I think. Have and we been don't have to watch the subtitles. Successful. And we you don't, don't have, have to. <laughs> if, you, if you articulate properly, no, you don't. <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to talk to you um, also about the, the importance of choosing the right roles. You know, when we were talking earlier on, we were reminiscing about a platform performance of Beatrice and Benedict. Correct. Where uh, I was introduced to you on that occasion and uh, little did I know I'd have this opportunity of talking to you properly. A hundred years later, um, here we go again. But <laughs> I, I would have been listening much more carefully, I think, if I had known <laughs> that. But um, it's interesting because my friend, as I was telling you, an actress, was playing the chorus. It was a platform performance right. and she was playing a corresponding role in Much Ado, the Shakespeare text. She must of course, have been over hero. the years. I think that would be yes, right, yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, over the years, of course, and quite rightfully, she would bemoan the number of really good roles available to women in classical mm. theatre. Mm. Yes. One of the great prerogatives of the mezzo, of course, is that uh, you get particularly in the Baroque field, to nab some of the good male roles as well. Because there, any, aren't, <laughs> because there aren't any castrati. Um, but that is all over for me, unfortunately, because of my age, um, mostly, I, I would think. And I've, generally speaking, been much more comfortable going into the, the role of a male, because I'm, I'm not a girly girl, and I was, I did, I did Rosina and I did Cenerentola, but but they had they had spirit both both of those and and Beatrice I enjoyed very much, but uh, Melisande, yes. five minutes and that was done unfortunately. But so there aren't so many roles uh, I have done as uh, lots of cosi fan tutte's of course, but um, mainly the trouser roles of Mozart and and Handel and Strauss of course. And for women generally in operatic terms, in terms of the roles available, do you think, do you feel well served? I have been tremendously well served. Uh, I was very lucky, again, may have t to do with the, 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 the decade in which I, I established myself or was established or was lucky enough to be employed, whatever you want, just to start off. Because I was, I remember feeling that I was always asked to do a role, particularly again through Mr. Ponell. I would be asked to do a role because he thought it might suit me. It may have been for a soprano, it may have been for a, an alto, it, 
but if he he trusted me and I don't know that that opportunity exists so much uh, anymore you know I think that's that's very very important and of course I I can't say that I could have done any of this without my agent I had a wonderful agent from the very start we started together and his successor is now my agent and she's wonderful but he was absolutely key to um to to my work he advised me very wisely he was there for me the whole time um he retired from the agency some years well, it's only three years ago and within five minutes he's running the metropolitan opera so you know the 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 talent that he had a gentleman in in his in the business he knew his his work he knew his his music and he knew how to behave, you know, he wasn't a cutthroat, you know, I'll do this in or, or trying to push people. He, he, if he thought it wasn't right, he wouldn't, he wouldn't suggest it, you know. So it, I was very, very lucky with that. You are as busy as you have ever been. <coughs> um, you'll be returning to sort of, well, in some ways, the site of a, a former triumph when you uh, sing in Salzburg this summer. Yes, gosh, again. Yes. In a, an opera that you know uh, so well. But I want to talk about some of those other roles that, that, of course, inevitably come with the experience over the year. You've been um, a judge, for example. Yes. In the Cardiff Singer of the World just mm-hmm. a, a few years back. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that interests me about singing, of course, you've always been enormously successful in competition yourself. But it must be very interesting to travel the arc from participating to now judging and Mm -hmm. it seems that the competitive arena has become even more important for young singers than it was. Mm -hmm. I have had the great opportunity and privilege to be on a board of of, uh, judges for whatever, this, that and the other. Just speaking for myself, when I listen to uh, some of the repertoire that young artists uh, offer in in uh, competition one wonders why you know so many young I'm talking about very young people so many young people the only way I can put it they don't sing their age they sing 10 years ahead they sing 15 years ahead and they're only going to be young for so such a short period of time sing what you can sing now and sing it better than anybody else You've got to be as good as the best or different. As uh, we get near the end of the time that we spent, and I hope you don't mind because it's something that I, not that, that I feel you would ever be uncomfortable with, but you're very modest about your achievements over the years and you've had uh, some extraordinary um, recognition from all quarters of the musical world. Um, you've had an honorary degree, of course, from NUI. I you know, an isn't that degree. amazing? And you've also uh, been awarded an honorary uh, damehood of the British Empire for your services to opera and to music, which is a very rare thing. And also for particularly for your time in Jeremy Kammersanger, I think, yeah. of the Court Opera and the Bavarian um, Medal. These are extraordinary uh, things to yes. happen. And they must... <laughs> be very gratifying they're very humbling i have to say mm. because it's not it's not just me you know they represent what everybody else my present singing teacher my my past singing teacher all these experiences have have given me these stepping stones this confidence mm. um the feeling of maybe i can do it that i i'm allowed to be honest in my imagination that i'm allowed to open up my heart a little bit Um, my feelings and there's no better way of doing it than having this beautiful music in front of you wonderful words and as I say to the singer sometimes being part of book club we all read the same manual we all read the same book but what's so exciting why why is Harry Potter why has that been sold a zillion times because each child each adult each person who has read that book, for example, or Shakespeare, excuse me, for taking Harry Potter out of the air. But, you know, whoever has read the book, they have their own fantasy world into which this book has led them. Whether you've seen the films or listened to Stephen Fry's tapes or whatever it might have been, it doesn't matter. For you, at that moment, you're the only person who has ever sung this piece. It's a first time. Every time you step out on the stage, it should be a 
in my opinion, try to be a first time because there are going to be many people in the audience who have never heard it before and it's a first time for them. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. What a fine lineup of sparkling talent. And, and you all look very well, too. <clears throat> uh, we're on the air live in about a minute and a half's time, all right? <laughs> um, we're live on Radio 3 on the Lyric FM, and this has been streamed live by the website here at Wigmore Hall. It's a very, it's a very extraordinary occasion. <clears throat> so I will just wait <coughs> for the queue from our studio, and then we'll be going for real. So. Feel free to relax gently, but not for too long. <coughs> and uh, be prepared to um, rise in your seats as well, of course, <coughs> when I give you the cue, if you would be so gracious. Um, everyone well? Are you all looking forward to this evening? <coughs> uh, and also, just d please, don't forget to turn off your mobile phones. Do turn them off. Don't put them on silent, because they have a nasty habit of interfering with, with um, radio waves. Um, so anything that might go pop, including a watch, please make sure it is stifled. And in the unlikely event of putting down in water, the exits are clearly marked, <clears throat> and there will be charming uh, ushers to, to make sure that, that you leave. Um, well, in the nicest possible way. Welcome, Falcher, a dinner issue. We're at Wigmore Hall in London, live on BBC Radio 3 and on RT Lyric FM, and indeed around the globe with Wigmore Hall's streaming for the centenary celebration of Irish culture in Britain. Uh, we have a long, sometimes tumultuous, relationships as nature, um, never intended, but as neighbours should. Uh, they've never been more harmonious, I think, than they are at the moment. And music and the arts have played their part because we do share so much. We commemorate too this evening 1916, the Easter Rising, the birth of the Irish Republic, also the loss of life on both sides, and in the Great War, where so many Irish lives were lost. You'll hear later settings of the Meath poet Francis Ledwich, Irish nationalist, but who died at Gallipoli in 1917. Such are the complexities of our lives. On this very historic occasion, we have the flags of both nations here on stage at Wigmore Hall, and we have singers from both nations, and young voices from the Royal Academy of Music in London and the Royal Irish Academy of Music in Dublin. There's an historic reason why the patron of Wigmore Hall, the Duke of Kent, can't be here. He had a last-minute dinner invitation to Windsor Castle, which he couldn't, <laughs> couldn't really say no. So, <laughs> as I ask you to rise for the British and the Irish national anthems, may we wish Your Majesty a very happy and glorious 90th birthday.
the two national anthems sung live here at Wigmore Hall. And of course, the arrangement of the British national anthem is by Benjamin Britten when Her Majesty the Queen opened a Snape Maltings for the Albra Festival. Very moved, and she said, I have heard it once or twice before. Well, so to the music of this great evening, our young singers shortly, but first the young pianist Finine Collins, born in Dublin, studied at the Royal Irish Academy of Music, won the Clara Haskell International Competition in 1999. And he begins our Schubertiad, which indeed this first half of the programme and the celebration of <coughs> Irish culture and musicians is at Wigmore Hall. One of the remarkable and original impromptus from the set of four the 899. It's a simple theme woven into a web of beauty and the key is C minor. There'll be more Schubert to come. This really does start us off in fine fashion. Thank you. 
Can Ian Collins playing the impromptu in C minor, the eight nine nine number one by Schubert, beginning our Schubertia, the first half of this great celebration of Irish music gift at Wigmore Hall. But our first set of singers arrived back on the platform here after singing the national anthems at the beginning uh, of Britain and Ireland. Robin Trichler, Gavin Ring and the pianist Jonathan Ware. But first, it's the artist who takes centre stage in these celebrations tonight for the contribution she has made, not just to Irish culture, but to music making worldwide. Anne Murray is going to sing the sublime Nacht und Trauma, the dreams we mere mortals have born on the darkness of holy night. But first, it's Schubert's most famous song, a poem by his friend Franz von Schrober. Our heartfelt thanks for the gift of music and its power to transcend, to which we all say are and the music.
And Murray singing Knocked on Trauma before that Andy Musi. Well, another famous Schubert song used with variations of the trout. We have the trout caught by the deceitful angler, Gavin Ray. <laughs> Eine Fäschlein hätte das Schoß in Freiheit, die launische Vorräte vor über die Einfalt. Ich stand an die Geschmade und sah in süßer Ruh des bunten Fischleins Bade im kahlen Fäschlein zu, des bunten Fischleins Bade im kahlen Fäschlein zu. Ein Fischer mit der Rute wohl an dem Hofe stand und saß mit kaltem Blute, wie sich das Fischlein fand. Solang die Wasser heller, so dachte ich nicht gebricht, so fängt er die Worte mit seiner Hangel nicht. So fängt er die Worte mit seiner Hangel nicht. Ich war dem Tier die Zeit zu lang. Er war das Wäschlein täglich drüber, und hätte ich es gedacht, so zog das seine Rute, das Wäschlein, das Wäschlein zart und dran. Und ich mit regem Blut sah die betrockene Hand, und ich mit regem Blut Sad he mit Rockman. Try Port D. Forella by Schubert Gavin Ring and Jonathan Ware. Well, it's the stars next. Let your glimmer be our blessing. Robin Trichler with Die Sterne.
the blessing of the stars to light and love. Robin Trichler is now joined by Anne Murray for Licht und Liebe. Heart seeks for a bliss of love, for it is a sweet light. And now something much more dramatic, Davin Ring as the Earl King.
Gavin Ring is the terrifying Earl King. The dramatic evocation of the supernatural phantom takes the boy from his father as they ride home on a stormy light. A peerless evocation of the story. Well, our three singers have delighted us so far. Gavin Ring, Anne Murray and the pianist Jonathan Ware now leave the stage. And we move to a, the next. The stand comes on, a stool is moved and we should have the entry of the celestial instrument of angels. Here comes a harp <laughs> bouncing along uh, the stage, and it's harbinger of our next artists, the instruments player, Lucy Wakeford, and the soprano, Eilish Tynan. And they are going to give us one of the seven songs from The Lady of the Lake by Walter Scott. Schubert hoping to cash in on Walter Scott's enormous popularity and bring him even more fame. Ellen's Gesang is much better known as the Ave Maria. Uh, here, it's an impassioned plea to the Virgin, sung as clansmen prepare to defend their land against the King. Eilish Tynan and Lucy Wakeford.
Ellings Gazang, from the Lady of the Lake by Walter Scott, her life of its own at the Ave Maria of Schubert, sung by Edith Timing at the Lucy Wakeford on harp. Well, Schubert, of course, is the master in this first of this great celebration um, of Irish culture, and it's, well, from a plea uh, to the Virgin for help for the impassioned loneliness of the shepherd on the top of his mountain top. Um, Der Hirt auf dem Felsen, the shepherd on the rock, a show piece from many a singer in the past, and it's a wonderful converse between voice and clarinet. The shepherd is in the high mountains thinking of the beloved, and as he sings, his voice echoes around the valley. When I stand on the highest rock, look down and sing far away below the echo ravines and rises up. Well, the conversation takes place between Eilish Tynan, the clarinetist Michael Collins, there of a famous Irish name, and Jonathan Rare on the piano.
hope and joy for that lonely shepherd on the rock. Spring is coming, my love, I shall I make ready to journey. Conveyed with a huge sense of joyous infectiousness by Ailish Tynan and Michael Collins with Jonathan Ware at the piano. A Shepherd on the Rock by Schubert. Well, next we're reaching the end of our Schubertiad here at uh, Wigmore Hall. It's all Irish music in the second half. And after that, um, we have Tara Eracht, the mezzo next, joined by young voices from the Royal Academy of Music. Uh, in London. The text of this is Franz uh, Grill's Panzer. Uh, he made a setting for women's voices, but it is men's as here. Um, they'll be coming onto the stage in a moment, not like Schubert at the first public performance, which is the Philharmonie. Uh, he nearly missed it. Friends just got out of the Oak Tree Ale House in time. <laughs> so it's an exhortation for the beloved to come out and not sleep. Roshi Amato, William Blake, Richard Walsh, and Thomas Bennett from the Royal Academy of Music joining Tara Era.
Schubert's Stenchen. What an invitation. How could you resist if you were asleep? And that was the serenade. Tal Erocht with Jonathan Ware at the piano. And those young voices from the Royal Academy of Music in London. Hiroshi Amato, William Blake, Richard Walsh and Thomas Bennett. I think um, definitely voices to look out for. Um, well, as our singers steal quietly away, our Schubertiad is now at an end. The second half of the celebration of Irish culture in Britain focuses on music from the Emerald Isle. So, time for the interval, BBC Radio 3 and RTE Lyric FM go their separate ways now, but just for 20 minutes. Thank you, Sean. And indeed, in our interval, Bernard Clark chats with the composer, Gerald Barry. Old Lang Syne from the poem by Robert Burns, now a traditional folk song. Burns never intended his work to act as a farewell to the old year and he certainly would never have imagined it as the astonishing opening to Gerald Barry's opera The Importance of Being Earnest. But there it is. And what's more, it works. What kind of an ear makes these kind of connections? With that in mind, we sought out Gerald Barry and asked him to take us back into his childhood, his student years, the innards of string quartet and opera. Our first question to him, what are his first musical memories? I remember as a small boy, I'd, maybe I was eight or some kind of age like that, um, in the church there, there, were t- there were two women who played the harmonium accompanying the choir, and one of them uh, was boring and didn't do anything for me, and the other one was very exotic and excited me incredibly. And I figured out, uh, even though I was eight or whatever, that the reason uh, the boring one bored me was because she used um, very ordinary uh, harmonies playing the harmonium, conduct, um, um, accompanying the choir. And the other one used very exotic harmonies occasionally. And I had um, this down to a fine art of listening and waiting and I would look up for Sunday Mass or whatever to the gallery to see which woman was at the harmonium and my heart would kind of go to sleep when I saw that it was the boring one. When I saw it was the other one, I would get all excited and um, I had figured out by then, because often the hymns were the same, where in the hymns these harmonies came and I'd wait for them, I knew the moments. And then the, they would come and the hairs of the back of the neck would rise and uh, uh, would give me intense uh, pleasure. So um, uh, early memories like that were very, um, well, uh, uh, striking. And uh, other memories, I suppose, would be my uncle, Paddy Murphy, was a very respected uh, concertina player in Clare. And I used to sometimes go and stay with him in his uh, in West Clare in this remote um, farm on a hill surrounded by trees. And um, sometimes I'd have to go to bed early-ish because I was so young. But I would have been really only again about maybe six or eight or years old or whatever. And some musicians would come to visit him because he was respected, and they would sit in a semicircle 
around the fire and play. And I was slept in this garret and um, I'd stick my head around the door and look down into the kitchen. The kitchen was very, uh, one of those traditional kitchens with a very high ceiling, almost like a chapel, this soaring ceiling. And so it was so high that it could accommodate this garret within it. And uh, there was a, a very steep stairs going up into the garret. And I would look down and see the semicircle of musicians with the, f with the um, fire burning in front of them. And um, uh, and sometimes I I would, did stay up a little bit longer. And um, in in those days, in those old houses, they were extremely cold. And uh, the only warm place was really beside the fire. So your front side was roasting, your back side was freezing. And um, so uh, I remember sitting uh, outside the circle of these musicians and watching them as if they was uh, as if they were on stage with the dark kitchen um, um, joining off into the distance. And uh, so memories like that were uh, would have been very important. And do you, do you think? I mean, this is a, probably an impossible question. I'm sorry, but do you think that your taste for adventurous music, which you're well known for, in your life? all your life as a composer. I mean, I've, I've been talking to you for at least 15 years. I've never, ever accused, turned up to meet a conservative Gerald Barry, yeah. and I don't think I ever will. But, but do you think that literally stems from the exotic harmonium player and then this sense of theatre, this sense of, for opera? I mean, I've seen two of your operas live. I've heard all of your operas, mm -hmm. and they have an ex extraordinary staging. Now, I know there's producers and directors in, involved and stuff like that, but that sense of ritual, do you mm -hmm. think they stem from that? Um, yes and no. Uh, yes, because I experienced them. Of course, uh, the earliest memories are often, uh, or can be anyway, the most important, because they form you throughout your life. They're the kind of thumbprints that uh, go with you. But um, but uh, more than that, I think you're simply born. You're lucky enough to be born with uh, a certain gift for something, and I was born with this particular gift. And it isn't something that is learned in a, a, education doesn't have anything to do with it. Uh, and it simply just surfaces then at some stage randomly. And that's it, really. It's just, uh, it's nothing to do with, um, it's, it's outside your environment, really. It just is part of some peculiar biological DNA type thing. But feeding it, if you like, but you know, nurturing it. Mm. Uh, and I'm thinking back to Claire in, in your youth. Yeah. Would have, would have, like, with your mum and dad have an extensive record collection, or I, you mentioned your uncle being a fantastic concertina player, but or was it radio that was your window onto the world? Uh, well, yes, radio, because we didn't have a record player, we didn't have television, there was no piano, there was nothing in our house. We didn't, we hardly had any money <laughs> to begin with. So uh, it was just a radio, really. And uh, that was how I discovered music. I mean, I told this story before, but how I heard this woman singing Handel and all of that. And uh, that was, though not that I knew this, uh, anything about music or Handel or anything, but that's what it was. And that is then what uh, woke me up. And the first time I heard this woman singing on the radio one evening, I, uh, I tried to tell, me, tell uh, what had happened to me, and I didn't have a vocabulary, so I went silent for a year. And then something similar happened a year later, and then I was off. You know, like the the, the horses at Cheltenham. <laughs> and uh, then uh, that would I would have been about maybe eleven years old or something uh, thereabouts. And then it started from there. And so then you started musical training, and well, yes, uh, I I uh, immediately uh, well very quickly worked out. I became laser like uh, I started writing music immediately. And um, uh, and I knew that I would have to go study university and all that stuff. And um, uh, I, because, uh, you know, when you're 14 or whatever, you don't have any sense of standing or hierarchy or everything, so I, or anything like that. So I wrote to the professor of music at um, 
University College Dublin and asked if he would come and see me. <laughs> and I also wrote to the professor of music at Trinity College uh, if he would do the same. Uh, and bizarrely, they did. Uh, 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 when they happened to be in the area in Clare, I was at school and this uh, canon came in and said, this very important person had come to see me and he combed my hair and brought me into this room and this, there was this um, f fat or cor or corpulent man and uh, said that, you know, he'd come to see me because I'd written to him and uh, I said, well, I, I, need, I, I said I need to go to Vienna uh, because I had this idea about Vienna in my head. And he said, well, you know, very kindly, there were a few things I needed to do before I went to Vienna. And so uh, he, I think he gave me some tests on the piano or something. And then, and then he went off. And then the professor of music at Trinity College, uh, which was, the, you know, the Protestant University, mm. um, uh, Kay wrote to me and said that he had received my letter and he'd be very happy to see me, and he was in Limerick at a certain time, and uh, so I went to see him. And um, then I uh, I chose uh, University College Dublin above Trinity for only one reason, uh, because yeah, I was very um, uh, relentless in my focus. I knew that University College Dublin did, had a travelling studentship when you graduated and you could go off to Europe. Trinity didn't, so that's the only reason. But I spend most of my time in Trinity, and usually, like all the people, the students at the time, usually drunk, uh, <laughs> most of the time drunk, in Trinity. And uh, Trinity was wonderful, really. I mean, when you think it was so innocent in those days, when you're terms of, in terms of security, you could spend, I would spend all night in Trinity uh, at, at number five in the music department. Um, and I love the atmosphere there, this wonderful 18th century building, um, 17th century, uh, whatever. Uh, and I would sometimes spend all the night in the chapel uh, playing the organ until four, five in the morning. You know, can you imagine doing that now? You said you were playing the organ. And were you playing improvising Gerald Barry? Or you no, no, Bach no, 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 no. I, 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 I studied um, organ with um, uh, Gerald Gillen in Dublin, and uh, it would I would be playing Bach uh, and M. Messiaen um, and uh, whatever it was early Dutch music. Um, it was would it be only that? I mean, I mean the Bach works are of course incredibly demanding, and um, so I would just um, often play them throughout the night. Yeah. And what about chamber music, Gerald? I mean, when did you do you remember when you first encountered it and and it hit you? Or um, you well, I, I had um, I was always having uh, visionary moments. Every second day, I had a vision, a vision, and uh, I was always in a state of. Um, uh, of <laughs> always in a visionary state and I went to this concert at the Limerick School of Music and I, have, I don't really have any memory of the, what the music was though I think it was one of the pieces of my Mozart and I left that in a kind of uh, levitating state I was about maybe 15 at the time uh, thereabouts and um, simply because I was transfixed by the colour the music may have been Mozart, but it was the colour of the instruments, not the music really, though I'm sure the music played a part, that uh, transfixed me. It was the colour of the body of the cello, and um, which sent me into a complete and utter spin. Incredibly lucky. Uh, there was a cinema in Limerick called the Savoy Cinema. I don't know if it's still I don't know if it's there anymore. 
and the Orte Symphony Orchestra would come there and give concerts. And I, through randomly not knowing anything about music, went to uh, two concerts there, and the program for one was um, Janacek's Glagolithic Mass, and it may have had a Bach cantata. And in another concert, the Hungarian pianist Tamás Vasari, however you pronounce it, played the Chopin Second Piano Concerto, which is the most, one of the most haunting things ever written. And um, what's something else? So I was, I was very lucky mm. to suddenly mm. uh, come across this extraordinary music. So, um, and what that like leaves you then? You come out of the say concert in the Savoy in Limerick in the Chopin Number Two. Mm. And the next day, you, you, you're looking for the score, and are you no, deciding you're going to score. do it? The there terms? are no scores. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, you were talking about 1966 or whatever, whatever year it was. Um, no, no, I mean, uh, no scores. Uh, no, uh, I mean, uh, there was a music shop in Limerick called Kleiser, a German, run by a German family. And uh, that was a kind of mecca for me because I would go there and they had cardboard boxes full of uh, music and they had editions of Mozart, Haydn and Beethoven sonatas. You could buy them separately. And uh, there were these editions published in London by, I think, uh, Augener, as they were called, A-U-G-E-N-E-R. And they had colours on the covers. One was red, one was green, um... I remember, I think red and green were the ones I remember, and I used to be fascinated by these, and as much the print and the colour as the music. And uh, so they were a real, uh, that was a real mecca for me. When you when you sit down to, to, to write a work, Gerald, I mean, this is an ongoing process now for your all your life, etc. Do you begin with a vision of the piece? For instance, the string quartet is here, number one is on the table here in the score, but even uh, the most recent opera, and now I know you're working from a text, but are you, are you beginning from the concept or are you starting literally with a, 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 a kind of a, a hum of sound or a rustle of words? Or is, um, is there it's you... totally random. Uh, I mean, for instance, uh, one rarely starts with, um, I mean, you're lucky to have if one has a vision or a concept or whatever, but usually I make my way along. Uh, I mean, uh, um, this piece, for instance, the String Quartet, uh, this is the new version of it. And the first version uh, moved uh, to different worlds more. And this version stays in the same world. Uh, it contemplates the same place uh, more. And it also refers to music from my first opera, The Intelligence Park. And the principal sounds, or principal pitches in this uh, music from The Intelligence Park um, are uh, the gaps between the, the main notes are filled in which produces these rushing, fast passages. And uh, they're like line drawings, uh, really, in, in music. It's like having a skeleton with these principal pictures, which are then fleshed out by these um, uh, jo joining um, uh, um, passages. So, you, you, you know, one has ideas like, like that. Um, but um, something like The Importance of Being Honest, or the opera that I've just finished, Alice's... Adventures Underground. I mean, there you have, of course, the text from the author, and that's um, a wonderful uh, scaffolding to build on. Freude, schöne Götter, Funken, Tochter, Haus, Elysium, Seele, Töten, Feuer, Tunken, Himmel, Schöne, ein Heiligtum. Deine Zauber binden wieder, was die Mode streng geteilt. Alle Menschen werden Brüder, wo dein Sauter Flügel weilt. Deine Zauber binden wieder, was die Mode streng geteilt. Alle Menschen werden Brüder, wo dein Sauter Flügel weilt. Alle Menschen werden Brüder, wo dein Sauter Flügel weilt. In, a, in the new quartet or in the new Alice opera, is there a chance that, for instance, and I don't, I don't, I don't know if this is, I might be talking through my hat here, so please forgive me, um, but is there a chance that you're saying to yourself as you begin, okay, I, I've been trying to, I've been wrestling with this particular problem for a long time, and I'm going to nail it in this particular piece. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Is there any kind of things that follow from work to work where you say, oh, I didn't Quite, you know, next time. I, you the know. only thing that sort of comes to mind is maybe uh, in the amount of text. Um, in um, in uh, earlier operas of mine, The Intelligence Park and The Bitter Years of Petra von Kant, one thing that sometimes people have uh, issue with is the amount of text. 
and the density of the text and the kind of text it is. That is something I... That issue, I understand it. And... Uh, uh, but I, I... I love these operas. I think they're wonderful. They... They will have their day eventually. Um, sometimes things need a certain kind of time to surface in. And um, but I did make a distinct uh, effort, conscious in the importance of being honest, for instance, to use text only that would be. Um, there would be no issue of difficulty in communication with the audience. So I was conscious of more, a, a more pressing, urgent need not to have any difficult issues of communication. So does that is the only thing that occurs to me. You were listening to composer Gerald Barry in conversation there with Bernard Clark. Gerald, Gerald Barry, uh, whose new version of his um, Gerald Barry, whose new version of his string quartet, we will hear here shortly. We're live here at Wigmore Hall. Well, we welcome back now, listeners, to RT Lyric FM in Ireland for the second half of the centenary celebration of Irish culture in Britain. We're at Wigmore Hall in London, live on BBC Radio 3 and Lyric FM, and all this has been streamed live around the world on Wigmore Hall's own website. We have some of the outstanding young Irish voices uh, in music from Ireland now, uh, a special presentation to Anne Murray as well, who, of course, will be singing too. I think she does so well. But we begin with that string quartet by Gerald Barry that talked about revised and rewritten um, for tonight. And he talked about it staying in the same place rather than wandering the previous edition. And it's the Contemporary Quartet, formed in Bucharest, moved to Galway 2003, um, now a quartet and residence at RT since 2014. They call themselves the Abba of classical music, but the two violinists are married and the violist is married to the cellist. The RT Contemporary Quartet with the String Quartet uh, number one by Gerald Barry as revised specially for today.
Gerald Barry, string quartet number one, played by the RTE Contemporary Quartet here at Wigmore Hall, setting up the Irish celebrations uh, in this great um, gala concert. Uh, co commissioned by RTE and the Wigmore Hall with support by Andrew Hoffman, president of the Foundation Hoffman, uh, a Swiss grant making foundation. Well, Finine Collins next, uh, just a little bit of stage furniture moving on Wigmore Hall platform. Geneva Conservatoire, winner of the Clara Haskell International Piano Competition in 1999. He played Schubert for us earlier and he opened the programme. He now plays music by John Field, an Irish composer, inventor of the nocturne. Yes, I know Chopin did add a little bit of polish, but still... Uh, <laughs> is he toured with Clementi, rather took advantage of him even though he was his teacher. Uh, when he reached St. Petersburg, he became so famous, he stayed there for 30 years, and so many pianists came uh, to study with him, to pay homage. The city became known as Pianopolis. Um, this is probably his last work, the Andante Inedi, uh, his, his very last work, and he is, I think, a composer who has come into his own again um, during like, his lifetime, one of Chopin's um, pieces were so like one by John Field that John Field felt very insulted but I suppose imitation is the best form of flattery and he must get his place I think in the sunshine. Finian Collins, um, young pianist who's also making a great reputation for himself uh, all over the globe and he heralds as it were the more relaxed if you like um, second part of this great occasion, Irish culture in Britain, a centenary celebration. Our York singers will be back uh, later, letting, as it were, their Celtic hair down. But here is Finian Collins, the Lady Andante Inedi, by John Field.
Finian Collins playing the Andante in AD by John Field. John Field, hugely famous uh, in his day. It was regarded as a sin against good taste not to hear him play. Well, I'm sure even John Field had his piano moved, just um, moving slightly to give room for our Yas singers who are about to come back. Um, songs coming up from the tenor Robin Trichler, the baritone Gavin Ring, and mezzo-soprano Tara Erach now. Uh, but first, music by a composer who made his name as a singer originally, Michael William Balf. Um, it mostly remembered now for his opera, The Bohemian Girl, and particularly for this aria, which became a, a favourite of Joan Sutherland in her day and indeed of Veronica Dunn uh, in Ireland. It's the heroine looking back wistfully at her childhood. And, uh, well, it has a certain, I suppose, nostalgic romanticism, but it's something that entwines itself into the heart as well, especially when it's performed by someone like Eilish Tynan, who is about to sing I Dreamt I, I Dwelt in Marble Halls. The pianist is Jonathan Ware, and our other singers will be along shortly after.
I dreamt I dwelt in marble halls by Balfour, Danish Tynan and Jonathan Ware. Now, if you ever go across the sea to Ireland, longing for the homeland is never far from the Irishman's mind. Tar Erecht. Bay of course, traditional Irish. Now, words by Tori Column, she moved through the fair.
Tara Errett singing on her own. Well, next from Benjamin Britten's folk song arrangements of the British Isles, one of the most beautiful folk songs with words by W.B. Yeats, Gavin Ring. along to this one. Silent now is the 
tapping there, no doubt about that. The Kerry dance, bright red for the days of youth before that, the Sally Gardens. Well, this concert at Wigmore Hall is a celebration of the role Irish musicians have played in London and throughout the world in the last hundred years. It commemorates the Easter Rising in Dublin in 1916, the lives lost on both sides, and the thousands and thousands of lives lost by Irishmen in the First World War. The County Meath poet Francis Ledwich, who was an Irish nationalist to his core, was killed on the Western Front in 1917. The music here of these two songs is by the English composer Michael Head. Here's Robin Tritchler.
Exquisite settings by Michael Head of the Continue Poet Francis Ledwidge, sung by Robin Fitcher with Jonathan Rare at the piano. Now, Anne Murray, celebrated for her international career at opera houses from Covent Garden to London and the Met and New York, concert platforms from Albra to Amsterdam, awards so many, including Henri Doctor at the National University of Ireland and Henri Dame Commander of the British Empire. But she's on home turf now, need I say more? Time to see for passing 
Yet, I'm delighted to say. <laughs> she has a little bonnet to give us. Murray gesturing towards everyone else to take the bow for helping her out in front of the Futures Ball. She stays on the platform now for another honour, a very special one from this temple of chamber music and song of this week, Moor Hall. The director, John Gilhooley, is here and also the ambassador to the Court of St. James in Ireland, Daniel Mulhall. and <laughs> On more curl, more curl curl and show curls for core on Ihe Nut, Augusta Sulagum Gawil to Galer Tanavas. Ladies and gentlemen, it's our great pleasure to award Anne Murray the Wigmore Hall Medal. She personifies everything that is great about this hall. For over 40 years, she has distinguished herself all over the world, and we salute her commitment to the song recital as a concert-going experience, not just here, but everywhere. And thank you so much. This whole week has been about you. We've made you the centre of it. Thank you for passing on your wisdom to all of the young students. And the ambassador will now read the citation and present the medal. I think um, Dame Anne Murray um, exemplifies the spirit of Ireland. She has conquered the world through her musical talents, but she's also represented Ireland proudly. She's being awarded this evening the Wigmore Medal in recognition of her preeminence as an international singer, and we heard that this evening brilliantly, um, but also her close links with the English National Opera, uh, the Royal Opera House, and her long list of international operatic recital accomplishments over, many, over uh, four decades. She's an inspirational figure and a magnificent representative of Ireland all over the world. She was awarded a, an honorary doctorate uh, by my university, the National University of Ireland, and she's also, in 2002, became Dame Anne Murray, and just for balance, she also has received an honor from the Bavarian state government, so she covers all the bases. <laughs> And I now have pleasure to, uh, uh, to present her with the Wigmore Medal. Well, Anne-Marie adding another treasure 
Another award to her long list of honours. It brings to an end almost a centenary celebration of Irish culture at Brigmore Hall. It would be a shame if Anne didn't reply to her award. She will do so in song, I think, assisted by the coterie of young singers who delighted us tonight and uh, young voices, I think, from the Royal Academy of Music and the Royal Irish Academy of Music as well. They're taking their bows now. If we do expect something that will maybe bring just a little tear to the emigrants. The Wigmore Hall, Ethel White, good night. Thank you for being with us.